Okay. Our scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. The triumph entry into Jerusalem. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to your daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them ahead of him and those that followed shouted hosanna to the son of david blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord hosanna in the highest and when jesus entered jerusalem the whole city was stirred and asked who is this and the crowd answered this is jesus the prophet from nazareth in galilee this end of the scripture reading for today So today is the day that we celebrate Jesus entering into the city of Jerusalem. And as we heard in our scripture for today, that is not too much unlike what the people of Jerusalem did on this day, right? We're told that as he rode the donkey and the colt that people gathered in the streets and laid palm branches before him. They did this because this is what people would do whenever a conquering general returned from battle they would go before him yelling his name and laying the branches of palms in his path for jesus as he is riding in they lay the branches and they shout hosanna what does that word mean we say it every year right we probably said it 50 times today already this morning easily but what does hosanna mean our children, you know, they, they, they prayed it around singing it today. Um, Hosanna originally meant save us. Now today it's become to, uh, something more akin to hooray, right? Oh boy, something of that nature. But back then it meant save us. And it's strange to think about how the meanings of words change, but it's important for us to understand what people were really shouting on that day. Because if the people that were gathered were yelling, Hosanna, yelling, save us, it implies that those that were say, saying that, shouting that, knew and believed that he was there to save them. He was there, finally, the one long prayed for, the one to deliver the people of Israel from the captors, the Messiah, Hosanna, Hosanna. And yet... At this time, the people that were shouting Hosanna that he was here to save us, they were also allowing themselves to assume. See, they were assuming that they knew what Jesus was there to do exactly. He was there to overthrow the Romans, to drive them out of Jerusalem and then drive them out of Israel. They assumed that he was about to lead a great revolution, one of no doubt violence that was going to free them. Indeed, the other revolutionaries of the city must have been preparing their weapons to fight alongside him. The religious leaders of the Jews believed that he was there to throw their world into chaos and disrupt their livelihoods. The Romans in the city believed he was just another Israelite there to stir up trouble. Surely his people will take care of this problem as they had done before. The people of Jerusalem, those that maybe didn't believe as much as those saying Hosanna in the streets, they had seen leaders rise up among the Jews and attempt to lead revolts against their captors before. 
and they knew how this would play out. Jesus would come into the city, find the ones that were willing to fight. Maybe he wins, probably he loses. And that is what I think most people of the city would have been thinking. Have you ever talked to someone about a problem that you have? And the only thing they respond with is, well, that's not going to work. You know, I've been struggling getting my kids to do their homework at night. I think I'm going to make them sit down and do it right after school and get it done. And then the person says back to you, oh, that won't work. I tried that. My kids were always too tired after school. Okay, well, then I'm going to try doing it after dinner. That way they've had time to rest and, and they're ready. Oh, that won't work. My kids were always too sleepy after dinner. Okay, then I guess I'll get them up at 5 a.m. so they can do the work before school starts. Oh, that won't work. I tried that before. I couldn't get my kids out of bed. Isn't it frustrating to find yourself in a conversation like that? Don't you just want to say to the person, hey, if you know everything that won't work, then how about you tell me what will work? And I can just hear the people of Jerusalem saying that to them among themselves. Oh, he's here to set us free? Well, that won't work. Sure, the Maccabees overthrew the Romans for a bit, but as you can see, the Romans came back and they took over the city again. There's nothing that he's going to be able to do. So the people that were gathered in the street, they were missing out on what Jesus was there to do because they were wrong in the assumption that they had seen it all before. They were right. He was there to lead a revolution, but not one based on violence. He was there to lead a revolution based on loving your enemy and turning the other cheek. Now, I want to talk about just uh, for a second here, the, the procession itself into Jerusalem and uh, why I believe it was a miracle in and of itself. You see, the fact that Jesus was able to enter with the group of people going before him peacefully into the city, I believe that is a miracle. Because if we look throughout history, whenever we see a large group of people gathered, especially in a situation that is very tense, in a situation maybe where they're gathering to protest against an injustice, which is what is going on here, we've seen that it takes just one person acting out in a violent way to ignite a spark that destroys the message. When we see people smashing windows at a protest, we lose the ability to consider what they were protesting, and we simply focus on the violence. But as Jesus comes into the city, as the people gather around him, there is no violence recorded. There is no great number of riots breaking out. Do you think the people of that time were more civilized than the people of today? Well, if you do, I must point out to you what they do at the end of this week to dispel that notion. See, I do believe it was a miracle that took place that day, that there was a miracle of peace on that day, because God had bigger plans. Now the people, they assumed that Jesus was there to free them from the Romans, but much more than that, he was there to free the Romans from themselves. He was there not to shed blood of others, but to save the world by shedding his blood. See, Jesus coming into Jerusalem to do something that had never been done before. Something the people couldn't possibly grasp at the time when it was happening. He was going to save them by sacrificing himself. Now the people of the city, they react the way most people do when something happens that they don't understand or is different than what they were sure was going to occur. They act out in fear. And perhaps the most human moment of all we'll see throughout Holy Week, we see that the people that shouted Hosanna as he entered in to the city, Hosanna, save us, as he entered into the city on Sunday, became the people that shouted crucify him on Friday. How could they do this? How could they change so easily? Well, how can we? How can we change from, yes, Lord, I love you, Lord, thank you, Lord, to, why are you letting this happen to me, Lord? Are you even there, Lord? See, we often look down on those people that turned on Jesus, but the truth is we struggle with that in our own lives all the time. 
We are human, they are human. We're not perfect and they weren't perfect. As I was preparing the sermon this week, I was struck by something that the author Paul Rock wrote in his notes for Palm Sunday, and it was this. Jesus came to start a revolution, one of grace, justice, forgiveness, and hope. I'll read that again for you. Jesus came to start a revolution of grace, justice, forgiveness, and hope. What a powerful message. So this Palm Sunday, are you carrying on the legacy of Christ? Are you treating others with grace, justice, forgiveness, and bringing them the message of hope? Well, I sure hope that we can say that we are, because unlike those people in Jerusalem, we are not assuming why our Savior came. We know why our Savior came. My challenge for you this week is simply this. Prepare yourself for Holy Week. Amen.